Okay, I'm recording now. So read these two chapters. There are three screencasts at the YouTube channel, which will provide an introduction to these two chapters. Um, part one of chapter 27. There's also a part two of chapter 27, which gives some examples. And then ch chapter 28. And these are the important equations that you need to get from these two chapters. First of all, the force on a charge that's moving through a magnetic field is QV cross B. That's called the Lorentz force. And the force on a little segment of current, since after all current just consists of moving charges, there'll be a force on the current. The force due to a little length of wire of length DS carrying current I is I DS cross B. Or if you want the force on a whole wire, you have to integrate along the wire, do a line integral. So those are the important um, basic equations for chapter 27. And chapter 28 is about how electric currents create magnetic fields. So here's one formula called the Bio Savar law, where you have a current in a wire, and this tells you the magnetic field that it produces. The current is all concentrated in the wire. So this is an integration over the wire. But of course the field fills up a whole volume of space. So this could be the magnetic field at an arbitrary point within the volume around the wire. So that's one way to calculate a magnetic field from an electric current. There is another formula which is sometimes even more useful, but it's not, uh, it's not appropriate for every problem, but that's Ampere's law. It says the circulation of B around some loop within the space is equal to mu zero times the current that's going through the loop. So Ampere's law says if you have a loop of well, it's not a loop of wire. It's just a it's just a mathematical curve in space, and there's a magnetic field. Um, well, let's say there's a magnetic field which is circulating around. In this volume, if you calculate the line integral of b dot ds, that's the circulation of b around this loop, that will be equal to mu zero, that's just a universal constant, times the current that goes through the loop. So if I put the current in a different color, let's say there's current maybe in a wire. So if you, if you calculate the total current, remember current from last week is charge per unit time going through the loop, then that's equal to the circulation of B around the loop. So for certain problems where there's a high degree of symmetry, you can use this result to determine B due to a current. So these two topics uh, you'll find in chapter 28 or in the screencast of the YouTube channel. And there'll be some long kappa problems where you have to use these. So that's sort of the subjects of this week. And now what I wanna do at, at this uh, meeting tonight is show some example problems. So here's a problem. It's one of the long kappa problems. Oops. This is a problem that's taken from the textbook. So it's a problem out of the textbook in chapter 27. 
it describes uh, an accelerator for alpha particles. Alpha particles are little charged particles. Alpha particles are, are introduced into this accelerator at the point A. They follow this trajectory and then they come out of the accelerator at a point B. So there are three regions. Regions R1 and R3, there's a magnetic field. Magnetic field points, I guess, uh, probably um, into the page away from you. And in region R2, there's an electric field. The electric field points to the right. And the question is, what's the kinetic energy when the alpha particles emerge from the accelerator? And the other question is, what's the position of the um, beam that's coming out of the accelerator? So, In a magnetic field, a particle travels along a circular arc and the kinetic energy does not change. That's because the magnetic field is perpendicular to the velocity. So work is force times displacement, but the force and the displacement are in perpendicular directions by the Lorentz force. So there's no work done by the magnetic field. And if you think back to mechanics, the change in kinetic energy is equal to work done by the forces. Well, in a magnetic field, there's no work done, so the kinetic energy does not change. So for example, the alpha particle is introduced at this point. It travels around on this arc, but it has the same kinetic energy at the lower point on the arc. Now, on the other hand, when it goes through an electric field, the electric force is in the direction of the electric field. So as it moves along that electric field, there is work being done. So the electric field does do work on a charged particle, and therefore the kinetic energy is increasing. Then when a particle reaches this point, it leaves the electric field, goes into a magnetic field. Again, it circles around on a, on a circular arc, but its kinetic energy doesn't change. Now here it just passes through empty space, circles around in the region R1, and then it goes through the electric field a second time. And as it goes through the electric field a second time, it gains kinetic energy because the electric force does work. So let's look at uh, parts A and part B what would be the equations to describe that? Well, part A has to do with the kinetic energy. So whenever the particle moves on a straight section, it's moving in an electric field. The change in kinetic energy is the work done by the electric field. That's the force times the distance, just like in mechanics. The force is the charge times the electric field. The, this distance is called L, it's given in the problem. It looks like it's, 0.5 meters. And it goes through the electric field, each particle goes through the electric field twice. So the total change in kinetic energy will be two times Q times E times L. So the kinetic energy that it emerges from the accelerator is equal to kinetic energy where it's introduced plus two times the charge times the electric field times the length of the electric field. So that's the work done by the electric force. And there's no work done by the magnetic force. Now part B is to determine this distance. You know, the particles are introduced at some position A, which has a Y coordinate y sub a, they travel around in the accelerator, they emerge from the accelerator at a different y value, at a different y coordinate, y at b, and you're supposed to calculate 
delta y. How much did y change? You can see y decreased. And so that occurs in the magnetic fields. So in each curved section where it's moving on an arc, um, well, the equation of motion is Newton's second law. Mass times acceleration is equal to force. Acceleration on a circle is V squared over R. So mass times V squared over R is equal to the force. That's Q times V times B. And you see you can solve for R, the radius. The radius is MV over QB, or in terms of kinetic energy, kinetic energy is a half MV squared. So V is the square root of two K over M. So for each of these circular sections or semicircular sections, you can calculate the radius of that semicircle. In this first semicircle, Y changes by two times that radius. It, it goes down. So delta Y is minus two R1 on the first arc, this little arc. On this arc, Y increases by two times the radius for R2, and then goes through again on a circle of radius or a semicircle of radius R3, and delta and Y changes by minus two times R3. So delta Y is minus two R1 plus two R2 minus two R3. So this is kind of typical of accelerator, particle accelerators. Uh, electric and magnetic fields are used to accelerate the particles. The magnetic fields accelerate the particles by changing their direction of motion. The electric fields accelerate the particles by increasing the kinetic energy. Here's another problem from the long kappa assignment. Again, I think this one, oops, I think this one also came out of the textbook. Yeah, it's it's a problem of chapter 27 in the textbook. It's called a rail gun. You have a projectile in the form of a short rod, which is carrying a current. And that's sliding on two rails. And these rails are attached to an electromotive force to drive a current uh, so that there's a current in the rod. And at the same time, there's a magnetic field produced by some big magnet or maybe by an electromagnet. So the electric current crosses the magnetic field. So there's a force on the rod. Remember the force on a little section of current, dF, that vector is the current times the length of that little section of current cross B. So every little section on the rod experiences a force in the direction of I cross B. You have to use the right hand rule to figure out what direction is. But if you let your right hand fingers curl from I, which is into the board or into the page, cross B, which is upwards, then your thumb points in the direction of I cross B, which will be in this direction. So the rod will be accelerated parallel to the rails. And the problem is to calculate the final speed. Now you have to use mechanics. You know what the force is. The acceleration is the force divided by the mass. So you have to know the mass of the projectile. You're actually given the density, mass density. So the mass will be the density times the volume. And once you know the acceleration, that'll actually be a constant 
for constant acceleration, you can calculate the final speed using the equations that you studied back in mechanics. So here are some of the equations that you would use. The force on the wire, well, the force on a little section of the wire is I dl cross B. So the force on the entire wire will just be I times the length times the magnetic field. And what's the length? Well, this distance is B, little b. So the length of the rod is B. So the force will be I B times B. And it's directed in the Y direction, this, this direction. So that's the force. The acceleration is that force divided by the mass. Now, what's the mass? Well, the mass is the mass density times the volume. What's the volume of a cylinder? You've got this little rod. It has a radius r. So the area is pi r squared. And it has a length. If I look back here, the length is this length. So it's b. So that's how you calculate the mass. And now you remember from physics 183, the equation for constant acceleration says that the change of v squared is two times the acceleration times the distance. You've got the acceleration. Now, what's the distance? Well, the distance is from this end to the other end. And you can see that length is a. So v squared will be 2 times the acceleration times a. So that's another problem involving the magnetic force on a current. So magnetism and electric, and electric current go together in two ways. First of all, magnetic field exerts a force on an electric current. And then secondly, electric currents create magnetic fields. In fact, that's where all magnetic fields come from ultimately. They come from electric currents. So watch the YouTube video if you're, if you're uh, not clear on that. But the next problem, no, the next problem is a little different. The next problem is again involving a force. I guess it's the, it's the final problem which involves calculating the magnetic field. This is again, given a magnetic field and given a current, what's the force? Now the current in this case is a little circular loop of wire carrying a current I. So there's a current I going around this loop of wire. And there's a magnetic field and the loop of wire is in that magnetic field. So again, if you use I cross B for the top side of the wire, I points into the page, I guess, no. I guess the current is this way. So I points out of the page, B points upward. So by the right-hand rule, there's a force in this direction on the upper part of the current loop. On the lower part of the current loop, I points into the board or into the slide. Cross B by the right-hand rule points this direction. And since the current is constant around the loop, the forces around the loop will all cancel. So there's no net force, but there is a net torque because you have forces in opposite directions on opposite sides of the current loop. So this is a problem. A loop of current is called a magnetic dipole. Magnetic dipole means a small current loop. So you have this current loop located at the origin and there's a magnetic field pointing in the Z direction. And you're supposed to calculate the torque if the magnetic dipole moment, so this is the dipole moment, M, it's a vector. It's at an angle theta with respect to the Z axis, which is the direction of B. So you have to have M cross B. 
So torque is m cross b. And if you remember your cross product, that's the dipole moment times b times the sine of the angle theta. And now if there's a torque on an object, there has to be an angular acceleration. And so part C of the problem is to calculate the angular acceleration. So let's again look at the equations. The first equation, the first question was calculate the torque. Well, again, I think this comes from chapter, I don't think this is a problem taken from the book, but there's a section in chapter 27 about the torque on a current loop. It's M cross B as a vector. Um, the magnitude of the torque is M times B times the sine of the angle between the two vectors. M here is the magnitude of the dipole moment so that's what's called M0. So M0 is given here. Part B is, what's the equilibrium value of theta? In other words, for some angle, there is no torque. So there'll be no acceleration. It'll just be at rest, Well, it won't be accelerating. So if you place the dipole at that angle, it'll just remain at that angle. That's an equilibrium. So that's when the torque is zero. Well, the torque is zero if the sine of theta is zero, that means theta is zero. So in other words, if the dipole moment, it points in the same direction as the magnetic field, that's the equilibrium position. The torque, I guess the, this torque will be in this direction, the torque will be in this direction, the torque vector. So again, using the right-hand rule, the acceleration will be up like this, directed towards lining up with the magnetic field. So a magnetic dipole wants to go to the equilibrium where the magnetic dipole moment and the magnetic field are parallel. And finally, if you started with the dipole moment, you know, the dipole moment is perpendicular to the ring, right? The dipole moment is normal to the current loop. So if you started with the current loop in this direction and you released it, what would be its acceleration? It will have an angular acceleration. And here you have to go back to physics 183 again angular motion, the equations for rotational dynamics. You remember the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration is equal to the torque. So this is not current, although it's used in, it's again using the letter I, but this I is the moment of inertia. This is just something from mechanics. Moment of inertia times angular acceleration is equal to torque. So you solve this for the torque, for the angular acceleration. All right, so those were three problems all involving chapter 27. Now this last problem is related to chapter 28. I don't think this comes from a problem in the book. But in chapter 28, well, the question is what's the magnetic field? And the Bios of our law is discussed in the first section of chapter 28. It says that if there's a current, if there's a little current I, times a length of wire, IDS, cross R hat divided by R squared. 
this is I hat, the unit vector. That will be the direction of the magnetic field. The magnetic field is mu zero, that universal constant, divided by four pi. I ds cross r hat over r squared. Now that's for current in a wire. So that would be, for example, I've had current in a wire going in this direction. Oops. So I have this current. I'm having too much luck here. If I had this current and the little section of the wire, a little section, let's say this little section here is ds. And I want to know the magnetic field someplace in the volume around that wire. I would use this equation. That's the Bios of our law. Now, this problem is different. This problem just has a single charge moving in this direction. You know, current is the motion of charge. So the simplest current of all is just one charge, one particle moving in that direction. So I don't know if this is written down in the book, but anyway, it's the same equation except you replace I ds by Q times V or delta Q, Q times V actually. See, Q times V has the same units as I times ds. And current, it comes from the motion of charge. So if the charge is Q and the velocity is V, Q times V is equal to I times the length. This is amps times meters. Amps is coulombs per second. So this is coulombs per second times meters. Well, charge is coulombs, velocity is meters per second. So this is also coulomb meters per second. So IDS for a single moving charge is the same as QV. So this very same formula, the Bios of our law, applies to the magnetic field produced by a single charged particle. So you have here a single charged particle Q moving along this direction, let's call that the x-axis with a velocity V, it will be creating a magnetic field throughout the volume of this space. And the problem is to calculate the magnetic field at this point, and this point, and this point. And the information that you're given is, well, you're given something called beta. Beta has to do with the velocity. The velocity is by definition, beta times the speed of light. And it also depends on the distance from the charge. You know, at this instant, the charge is at the origin. It won't stay at the origin because it's moving with velocity V. But at the instant of time when it's located at the origin, these three points are at, well, there's a distance A, B is at a distance A above the origin. C is at a distance A in the X direction and A in the Y direction. So its coordinates are A, A. And A, this point is at minus A, A. The X coordinate is minus A, the Y coordinate is A. So given that information, you're supposed to calculate the magnetic field. So again, let's look at what equations would be, would be needed to do that. We have the Bios of our law, which says the magnetic field at a point X is mu naught over four pi QV cross R hat over R squared. Now what's R? Well, actually it'll be a little easier if we write R hat is R vector divided by R. So this is mu naught Q over four pi V cross R vector divided by R cubed. Now the velocity is simple because the velocity is just in the x direction. So the velocity vector is V zero, zero, zero. It's in the x direction. 
Now, what's R? R is the vector from the charge position to the point where I'm calculating the field. So R is the vector X minus XQ. You see, XQ plus R, if I go to Q and then I add R, I end up at the point X that I'm interested in. So that means R is X minus XQ. X is, well, for A, it's minus AA, for B, it's zero A, for C, it's AA. What's XQ? Well, at this instant of time, XQ is zero, zero, zero. So this will be the magnetic field at these three points at the instant of time where the moving charge is at the origin. That field will change because the charge is going to move away from the origin. But anyway, we're just calculating the magnetic field directly above the charge or in the y direction and on two sides of it in the x direction. Now I have to do this cross product. So I hope you've uh, encountered cross products before. Um, one way to calculate a cross product is to use this determinant. Cross product of V cross R is I hat J hat K hat V, that's V X V Y V Z, that's V zero 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 R. Now, R is the same as X because X Q is zero. So R would be A A zero at this point. At the point C, you would put in, for R, you'd put A, A, zero. For B, for point B, you'd put in zero, A, zero. So this determinant, think back to high school when you calculated determinants, that's a mnemonic or a little reminder of how to calculate a cross product of two vectors. Now you see, if you calculate the determinant, you have I hat times this little cofactor down here, which is zero, plus J hat times this little cofactor, which is also zero, plus K hat times this little cofactor, which is V zero A. So actually V cross R hat is K hat V zero A, K hat points out of the X, Y plane. So if the particle's moving along the X axis, the magnetic field is pointing out towards you. More generally, the magnetic field curls around the current. So at points in the XY plane above the current, it'll be pointing outward. At points below the current, it'll be pointing inward. And in general, it will be curling around the X axis. That's one of the characteristics of the magnetic field produced by a current. It always curls around the current. The direction is given by the right-hand rule. If your thumb points in the direction of the current, which is the direction of the velocity, then your fingers curl around in the direction of the magnetic field, which is like this. So it would be outward on this side, it would be inward on this side. You're calculating it on this side, so it'll be in the Z direction. Now, you know, you have all the, you have all the parameters. Mu naught's a universal constant. Q must be, you must be told the value of Q down here, I suppose. And V0, you must be given the value of V0. No, you're given the value of beta. So you have to know V0 is beta times the speed of light. What's the speed of light? Well, the speed of light is always called C. It's 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So this little particle here is moving. I don't know, is that an electron? I think that's an electron, actually. No, it's a particle of charge Q. Charge is Q. Can't read that. I don't know. Maybe maybe the charge is the charge of an electron. I'm not sure. Maybe the charge is E. So I think this is an electron. It says a particle with charge Q, but I think what it really should say is it's an electron moving along the x-axis. 
what's the magnetic field that it's producing. And it's this distance is sort of like an atomic distance. It's 5.9 nanometers. That's a little larger than an atom, but it's kind of comparable to an atom. Size of an atom is something like a tenth of a nanometer. This is sort of 50 times larger. So I better check that problem that it says that Q is E, the charge of an electron. So you've got all the necessary numbers. You know, you, you calculate this. It's like it's the same in all physics problems. First, you calculate the answer using algebra and not using the numbers until you get a formula. And then once you have a formula, you get out your calculator and put the, you know, the numbers into the symbols and use your calculator to calculate the numerical values because Long Kappa will expect you to give numerical answers here. So that's an example of calculation of a magnetic field. I think there are probably some other Long Kappa problems which involve, for example, What's the magnetic field around a current in a wire? So that's a standard problem. You have current in a wire. There'll be a magnetic field that circulates around the current. So the magnetic field curls around the current. If the current is in this direction, the magnetic field will be this way. What's that counterclockwise? And that formula, you can, you can most easily derive from the Bios of our law. So if you look in chapter 28, you'll find a formula for the magnetic field around a wire. It's mu naught i divided by two pi r. where this distance is r times phi hat times the unit vector directed around the wire the azimuthal angle direction. So this is another example where given a current, what's the field produced by that current? Well, in the case of problem with a high degree of symmetry, you can get the answer using the using Ampere's law, and you'll find that someplace in chapter 28. I think there'll be problems like that on the Long Cap assignment too. So that's all I really prepared for tonight. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions on the chat room. Um, you have until Thursday night. So you have, you know, 48 hours to do these problems. Um, you know, start working on them now. Don't leave them until the last minute, because if you leave them all to the last minute, you'll be under a lot of stress to get them all done in time before the deadline. I didn't have anything more to discuss tonight. Anybody have any questions about uh, this week? Just unmute your microphone and speak up if you do. Okay, well, since there aren't any questions, I'll end the meeting. Um, let's see, I do record the meeting. How do I stop the recording? Stop the recording. So the meeting's recorded, and I put the recording on the YouTube channel. But since you've been here tonight, you don't need to look in the recording. <laughs>